Black Education, Achievements, Myths, and Tragedies. Will Rogers once said that it was not ignorance that was so bad, but, as he put it, all the things we know that ain't so. Nowhere is that more true than in American education today, where fashions prevail and evidence is seldom asked for or given. Nowhere does this do more harm than in the education of black children. The quest for esoteric methods of trying to educate black children proceeds as if such children had never been successfully educated before, when, in fact, there are concrete examples, both from history and from our own times, of schools that have been successful in educating black children, including those from low-income families. Yet the prevailing educational dogma is that you simply cannot expect children who are not middle class to do well on standardized tests for all sorts of sociological and psychological reasons. This dogma is not even true for the children for whom it is most often invoked, black American children, much less for minority children in general, whether in the United States or in other countries. Schools, past achievements. Contrary to prevailing educational dogmas, there are schools in America today where low-income black and other minority students do, in fact, score well on standardized tests. Both public schools and private schools, secular and religious, even as the vast majority of ghetto schools have abysmal performances on such tests. Moreover, there has been successful black education as far back as the 19th century. High-performance schools. In 1899, there were four academic public high schools in Washington, D.C., one black and three white. In standardized tests given that year, students in the black high school averaged higher test scores than students in two of the three white high schools. Today, more than a century later, it would be considered utopian even to set that as a goal, much less expect it to actually happen. Yet what happened back in 1899 was no isolated fluke. That same school repeatedly equaled or exceeded national norms on standardized tests in the 1930s, 1940s, and early 1950s. Back in the 1890s, it was called the M Street School, and in 1916, it was renamed Dunbar High School. When this information on Dunbar High School was first published in the 1970s, those few educators who responded at all dismissed the relevance of these findings by saying that these were middle-class children, and therefore their experience was not relevant to the education of low-income minority children. Those who had said this had no factual data on the incomes or occupations of the parents of those children, and the data that existed said just the opposite. The problem, however, was not that these dismissive educators did not have evidence. The more fundamental problem was that they saw no need for evidence. According to their doctrines, children who did well on standardized tests were middle class. These children did well on such tests, so therefore they must be middle class. It so happens that there was evidence on the occupations of the parents of the children at this school as far back as the early 1890s. As of academic year 1892-93, to of the known occupations of these parents, there were 51 laborers, 25 messengers, 12 janitors, and one doctor. That hardly seems middle class. Over the years, a significant black middle class did develop in Washington, and most of them may well have sent their children to the M Street School or to Dunbar High School, as it was later called, but that is wholly different from saying that most of the children at that school came from middle class homes. More detailed data on parental occupations are available for a later period, from the late 1930s through the mid-1950s. These data reveal that there were far more children whose mothers were maids than there were whose fathers were doctors. Mary Gibson Hundley, who taught at Dunbar for many years, wrote, A large segment of the homes of the students had one or more government employees for support. Before the 1940s, these employees were messengers and clerks, with few exceptions. It is possible, of course, to redefine middle class in relative terms for the black community as it existed at that time, but such verbal dexterity serves only to salvage words at the expense of reality. The parents of Dunbar students may or may not have been a random sample of the black parents of their time, either occupationally or in terms of their aspirations for their children, but neither were most of them people with professional careers, 
or levels of income that would be considered middle class by the standards of American society as a whole. Intellectual or academic achievements for blacks, as for everyone else, no doubt have preconditions, but the crucial question is whether these are economic, pre economic preconditions, as so widely asserted, and so widely assumed to be insuperable barriers to good education for minority children from low-income families. A related stereotype is that the children who went to Dunbar High School were the light-skinned descendants of the black elite that derived from the miscegenation during the era of slavery. Here again, the facts have been readily available and widely ignored. Photographs in old yearbooks from the era of Dunbar's academic success show no such preponderance of light-skinned blacks. Here again, there is a fundamental difference between saying that certain types of people were more likely to send their children to Dunbar, or that such children were overrepresented, and saying that most of the children who went to Dunbar came from such families. Whether in economic or other terms, the families from which the students of Dunbar High School came cannot be nearly so atypical as suggested by those who say they were mostly Washington's growing black bourgeoisie. For many years, there was only one academic high school for blacks in the District of Columbia, and as late as 1948, one-third of all black youngsters attending high school in Washington attended Dunbar High School. If we took only the children of doctors and lawyers, a former Dunbar principal asked, how could we have had 1,400 black students at one time? This was not a selective school, in the sense in which we normally use that term. It was not necessary to take tests to get in, for example, even though there was undoubtedly self-selection, in the sense that students who were serious went to Dunbar, and those who were not had other places where they could while away their time without having to meet high academic standards. A spot check of attendance records and tardiness records showed that the M Street School at the turn of the century and Dunbar High School at mid-century had less absenteeism and less tardiness than the white high schools in the District of Columbia at those times. In the 19th century, tardiness had at first been a problem, but it was a problem that was apparently not tolerated. The school had a tradition of being serious, going back to its founders and early principals, who reflected the influence of the New England culture, which contrasted so much with that of the culture of most blacks. Among those early principals was the first black woman to receive a college degree in the United States, Mary Jane Patterson from Oberlin College, class of 1862. At that time, Oberlin had different academic curriculum requirements for women and men. Latin, Greek, and mathematics were required in the gentleman's course, as it was called, but not in the curriculum for ladies. Miss Patterson, however, insisted on taking Latin, Greek, and mathematics anyway. We can only imagine what fortitude and sense of purpose that must have taken at a time when no black woman had ever gotten a college degree in the entire history of the country, and when most members of her race were still slaves in the South. Not surprisingly, in her later 12 years as principal of the black high school in Washington during its formative period, Mary Jane Patterson was noted for a strong, forceful personality, for thoroughness, and for being an indefatigable worker. Having this kind of person shaping the standards and traditions of the school in its early years undoubtedly has something to do with its later success. Other early principals included the first black man to graduate from Harvard, class of 1870. Three of the school's first ten principals had graduated from Oberlin, two from Harvard, and one each from Amherst and Dartmouth. Because of restricted academic opportunities for blacks, Dunbar could get teachers with very high qualifications, and even PhDs, among its teachers in the 1920s. Mary Gibson Hundley pointed out, in her history of Dunbar High School, Federal standards providing equal salaries for all teachers, regardless of sex or race, attracted to Washington the best-trained colored college graduates from northern and western colleges in the early days, and later from local colleges as well. One of the other educational dogmas of our times is the notion that standardized tests do not pre predict future performances for minority children, either in academic institutions or in life. Innumerable scholarly studies have devastated this claim intellectually, though it still survives and flourishes politically. But the history of this black high school in Washington likewise shows a payoff for solid academic preparation and the test scores that result from it. 
Over the entire 85-year history of academic success in this school, from 1870 to 1955, most of its graduates went on to higher education. This was very unusual for either black or white high school graduates during that era. Because these were usually low-income students, most went to a local free teacher's college or to relatively inexpensive Howard University. But significant numbers won scholarships to leading colleges and universities elsewhere. Early in the 20th century, some M Street School graduates began going to Harvard, the first in 1903, and other academically elite colleges. A French educator who visited the M Street School that year described its students as pursuing the same studies as our average college student. During the period from 1918 to 1923, graduates of this school went on to earn 25 degrees from Ivy League colleges, Amherst, Williams, and Wellesley. At one time during this era, there were nine black students at Amherst, six from Dunbar High School. Over the period from 1892 to 1954, Amherst admitted 34 graduates of the M Street School and Dunbar. Of these, 74% graduated from Amherst, and 28% of these graduates were Phi Beta Kappas. Nor was Amherst unique. Dunbar graduates also became Phi Beta Kappas at Harvard, Yale, Williams, Cornell, Dartmouth, and other elite institutions. At one time, the reputation of Dunbar graduates was such that they did not have to take entrance examinations to be admitted to Dartmouth, Harvard, and some other selective colleges. When Robert N. Mattingly graduated from the N Street School in 1902, he entered Amherst College, receiving credit for freshman mathematics and first-year college physics, and he graduated in three years, Phi Beta Kappa. Yet, far from being one of the elite, Mattingly was, in his own words, at Amherst on a shoestring. No systematic study has been made of the later careers of the graduates of M Street and Dunbar High School. However, when black educator Horace Mann Bond studied the backgrounds of blacks with PhDs in the 1970s, he discovered that more of them had graduated from M Street Dunbar than from any other black high school in the country. The first black who, pioneered in a number of fields, also came from this school. The first black man to graduate from Annapolis came from Dunbar. The first black enlisted man in the army to rise to become a commissioned officer also came from this same institution. So did the first black woman to receive a PhD from an American university. So did the first black full professor at a major American university, Allison Davis at the University of Chicago. So did the first black federal judge, the first black general, the first black cabinet member, the first black senator elected since reconstruction, and among other notables, the doctor who pioneered the use of blood plasma, historian Carter G. Woodson, author and poet Sterling Brown, and Duke Ellington, who studied music at Dunbar. During World War II, when black military officers were rare, there were among this school's graduates, many captains and lieutenants, nearly a score of majors, nine colonels and lieutenant colonels, and one brigadier general. All this contradicts another widely believed notion, that schools do not make much difference in children's academic or career success because income and family background are much larger influences. If the schools do not differ very much from one another, then of course it will not make much difference which one a child attends. But when they differ dramatically, the results can also differ dramatically. This was not the only school to achieve success with minority children. But before turning to other examples, it may be useful to consider why and how this 85-year history of dramatic success was abruptly turned into all-too-typical failure, virtually overnight, by the politics of education. The landmark racial desegregation case of Brown v. Board of Education initially led to a strong resistance to school desegregation in many white communities, including that in Washington, D.C. Ultimately, a political compromise was worked out in the District of Columbia, in order to comply with the Supreme Court decision, without having a massive shift of students, the D.C. school officials decided to turn all public schools into neighborhood schools. By this time, the neighborhood around Dunbar High School was run down, and there was a local saying that children who lived near Dunbar didn't go to Dunbar. This had not affected the school's academic standards, however, because black students from all the rest of the city went to Dunbar. When Dunbar became a neighborhood school, however, 
the whole character of its student body changed radically, as did the character of its teaching staff. In the past, many Dunbar teachers continued to teach for years after they were eligible for retirement because it was such a fulfilling experience. Now, as inadequately educated, inadequately motivated, and disruptive students flooded into the school, teachers began retiring, some as early as 55 years of age. Dunbar quickly became just another failing ghetto school, with all the problems that such schools have all across the country. Eighty-five years of achievement simply vanished into thin air. It is a very revealing fact about the politics of education that no one tried to stop this from happening. When I first began to study the history of this school, back in 1970s, it seemed to me inconceivable that this could have been allowed to happen without a protest. The Washington School Board in the 1950s had included a very militant and distinguished black woman named Margaret Just Butcher, who was also a graduate of Dunbar High School. Surely Dr. Butcher had not let all this happen without exercising her well-known gifts of withering criticism. Yet I looked in vain through the minutes of the school board meetings for even a single sentence by anybody expressing any concern, whatever, about the fate of Dunbar High School under the new reorganization plan. Finally, in complete frustration and bewilderment, I phoned Dr. Butcher herself and asked, was there anything that was said off the record about Dunbar that did not find its way into the minutes that I had read? No, she replied. And then she reminded me that racial integration was the battle cry of the hour in the 1950s. No one thought about what would happen to black schools, not even Dunbar. Now, decades later, we still do not have racial integration in many of the urban schools around the country. And we also do not have Dunbar High School. Such are the ways of politics, where the crusade of the hour often blocks out everything else, at least until another crusade comes along and takes over the same monopoly of our minds. Ironically, black high schools in Washington today have many of the so-called prerequisites for good education that never existed during the heyday of Dunbar High School. And yet, the educational results are abysmal. Adequate funding is always included among these prerequisites, and today the per-pupil expenditure in the District of Columbia is among the highest in the nation, while its test scores are among the lowest. During the years of Dunbar's success, success it was starved for funds, and some of its classes had more than 40 students. As a failing ghetto school today, Dunbar has a finer physical plant than it ever had when it was an academic success. Politics is also part of this picture. Immediate, tangible symbols are what matter within the limited time horizon of elected politicians. Throwing money at public schools produces such symbolic results, even if it cannot produce quality education. The aftermath of the decline and academic collapse of Dunbar High School is also revealing. With a new school building, the question arose as to the disposition of the original building. Dunbar alumni wanted that building preserved as some sort of memorial to an historic achievement. But Washington's political leaders, representing the kind of people who had not gone to Dunbar, were bitterly opposed. This became a heated legal issue, fought all the way up to the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. After the political leaders won in court, one of them spoke for those who say that the school represents a symbol of an elitism among blacks that should never happen again. I say we should raise it. They did. The dog in the manger triumphed once more. Washington Post columnist William Raspberry summarized the conflicting feelings about Dunbar High School in the black community when he wrote, Fill a room with middle-aged blacks who grew up in Washington. Mention the word Dunbar and then take cover. That one word will divide the room into two emotion-charged, outraged, warring factions. Those who did and those who didn't attend Dunbar High School when it was Dunbar. Despite the Supreme Court's pronouncement in the historic 1954 case of Brown v. Board of Education that racially separate schools are inherently unequal, there have been many predominantly or wholly minority schools whose test scores were at or above the national average. The average IQ at Dunbar High School was 111 in 1939 and again in 1950. Ironically, Dunbar was within walking distance of the Supreme Court, which, in effect, declared its existence impossible. However, it was not the only black school of which this was true, much less the only minority school 
for there have also been all Chinese American schools, and at least one all American Indian school, which have done the same. Many, if not most, predominantly minority schools have performed very poorly, but enough others have not, that this cannot be blamed simply on their being racially segregated schools. Not only did M Street Dunbar High School have a racially segregated student body throughout the 85 years of its academic success, so did St. Augustine School, a Catholic high school in New Orleans, which also met national standards in its early history. The first black student from the South to win a National Merit Scholarship came from St. Augustine. So did the first presidential scholar of any race from the state of Louisiana. When St. Augustine was studied back in the 1970s, 20% of all presidential scholars in the history of the state had come from this one school, with about 600 black students. Test scores were never used as a rigid cutoff for admission to St. Augustine. There were students there with IQs in the 60s, as well as others with IQs more than twice that high. Moreover, the average IQ of the school as a whole rose over the years, being in the 80s and 90s in the 1950s, and then reaching the national average of 100 in the 1960s. To put that in perspective, both blacks and whites in the South during this era tended to score below the national average on IQ and other standardized tests. By contrast with a private Catholic high school like St. Augustine, PS 91 in Brooklyn, New York, was a public elementary school, located in a rundown ghetto and housed in an even older building than the original Dunbar High School. Yet the students in most of the grades in this predominantly black school scored at or above the national norms on standardized tests when I studied it back in the 1970s. It was the only school in its district whose students were reading at or above the national average. The next best school in that district had fewer than 40% of its students reading at or above national norms, and a number of other schools in the district had fewer than 30% who reached that level. This was not in any sense a middle-class school or a magnet school. It was just an ordinary ghetto school run by an extraordinary principal. What was more extraordinary to me than even the test scores of the students was the openness with which I was welcomed and allowed to see whatever I wanted to see. Educators often like to give guided tours to selected and often atypical places, much like the Potemkin village tours in Tsarist Russia. But in PS 91, I was allowed to wander down the halls and arbitrarily pick out which classrooms I wanted to go into. I did this on every floor of the school. Inside those classrooms were black children, much like children you can find in any ghetto across the country. Many came from broken homes and were on welfare. Yet inside this school, they spoke in grammatical English, in complete sentences, and to the point. Many of the materials they were studying were a year or more ahead of their respective grade levels. None of these successful schools had a curriculum especially designed for blacks. Most had some passing recognition of the children's backgrounds. Dunbar High School, for example, was named for black poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and it set aside one day a year to commemorate Frederick Douglass but its curriculum could hardly be called Afrocentric. As Senator Edward Brooke, a Dunbar alumnus, put it, Negro History Week was observed, and in American history, they taught about the emancipation of slaves and the struggle for equality and civil rights. But there was no demand by students for more, no real interest in Africa and its heritage. We knew about Africa as we knew about Finland. Throughout the 85 years of its academic success, Dunbar High School taught Latin, in some of the early years, it taught Greek as well. Its whole focus was on expanding the students' cultural horizons, not turning their minds inward. Still less was its focus on giving students a sense of victimhood or of doors closed, though, in fact, many doors were closed to them throughout the history of Dunbar's academic success. On the other hand, many Dunbar alumni were the first to open some of those doors. Instead of today's fashionable focus on grievances, the tone was set by a poem on the assembly wall written by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, for whom the school was named. Its first stanza said, Keep a pluggin' away, perseverance still is king, time its sure reward will bring, work and wait unwearying, keep a pluggin' away. This was written at a time when racial segregation and discrimination were pervasive across the South and were spreading into the North when blacks were being lynched, 
and when the very school in which these words were posted received less money than white schools in the same city. Many today might disdain this message of self-improvement as naive at best, but the fact is that it worked, and much that is considered more sophisticated today has a dismal record of failure. A particularly painful example of contemporary failure is this account of Dunbar High School in 1993. Rodney McDaniel is a senior at Dunbar High School in Washington, D.C. He is captain of its football team, which is the best in the city. Rodney McDaniel evidently has the ability to take harder courses than he does, but he, like other students at Dunbar, has been held to low standards by teachers unwilling or unable to demand more. A smaller percentage of Dunbar students go to college now than did 60 years ago. 60 years earlier would have been in the depths of the Great Depression of the 1930s. Harlem and the Lower East Side Important as the history of outstanding schools for black students has been, there is also much to learn from the history of very ordinary urban ghetto schools, which often did far better in the past, both absolutely and relative to their white contemporaries, than is the case today. The test scores in ordinary Harlem schools in the 1940s were quite comparable to the test scores in white working-class neighborhoods on New York's Lower East Side at that same time. Sometimes the Harlem schools scored a little higher, and sometimes the Lower East Side schools scored a little higher, but there were no such glaring racial disparities as we have become used to in, or in urban schools in recent years. In April 1941, for example, some Lower East Side schools scored slightly higher on tests of word meaning and paragraph meaning than some schools in Harlem. But in tests given in December of that same year, several Harlem schools scored higher than the Lower East Side schools. Neither set of schools scored as high as the citywide average, though neither was hopelessly below it. While the Lower East Side of New York is justly known for the many people who were born in poverty there and rose to middle class levels, and some to national prominence, very little attention is paid to a very similar history in Harlem during that era. Some years ago, a national magazine ran a flattering profile of me, expressing wonder that I had come out of Harlem and, gone on to in, and had gone on to elite colleges and an academic career. Shortly thereafter, I received a letter from a black lawyer of my generation, pointing out that my experience was by no means so unusual in those days. He had grown up in Harlem during those same years, just a few blocks from me. From the tenement building in which he lived came children who grew up to become a doctor, a lawyer, a priest, and a college president. Indeed, where did today's black middle class come from, if not from such places and such schools? Parents have been an important ingredient in the success of schools, whatever the racial or social backgrounds of the students. But the specific nature of parental involvement can vary greatly and has often been very different from what is believed among some educational theorists. In some of the most successful schools, especially of the past, the parents' role has been that of giving moral support to the school by letting their children know that they were expected to learn and to behave themselves. Current educational fashions see parents' roles as more active, both on-site in the schools and in such things as helping with their children's homework. Whatever the merits or demerits of these notions, Historically, that was certainly not the role played by parents of, children's, of children at successful schools in the past, nor were parents necessarily equipped to play such a role. As of 1940, for example, the average black adult in the United States had only an elementary school education, usually in inferior southern schools. During that era, parents of children going to school on the Lower East Side of New York were similarly ill-equipped to be participants in the educational process. Immigrant children who grew up there have expressed painful memories of how their parents, with their meager education and broken English, hated to have to go see a teacher, and how embarrassed their children were when their parents showed up at the school. Among immigrant Japanese parents on the West Coast, what they had to offer their children was the value of education and discipline, even when the parents themselves were poorly educated. American parents today may be more educated and more sophisticated, but it is not clear that their involvement in schools has been a net benefit. At the very least, history shows that it has never been essential. 
Successful minority schools are not confined to history, however. They still exist in the third millennium, and they are still largely ignored by educators, politicians, community activists, and intellectuals. Schools. Contemporary Achievements. While schools for low-income and minority students that succeeded in the past often had to do so despite the indifference of boards of education run by white officials, those which have succeeded in our own time have often had to do so in the face of active hostility by education officials of whatever race. The principal of Bennett Q Elementary School in Inglewood, California, whose student body is 52% Hispanic and 45% Black, raised these children's reading levels from the third percentile to the 50th percentile in just four years, but she was threatened with loss of money because she used phonics instead of the mandated whole language teaching methods and taught exclusively in English instead of using the bilingual approach required by education authorities. The fact that she was succeeding where others were failing carried no weight with state education officials. Fortunately, it carried enough weight with the parents of her students that they bombarded these officials with the protests that caused them to relent and let this principal continue to succeed in her own way instead of failing in their way. In Houston, Texas, students in Wesley Elementary School, 92% Black and 7% Hispanic, were reading several years below grade level before a new principal installed a new curriculum and raised their, me their reading and math scores above the national average. But again, the methods he used were not those favored by the education establishment, which tried to stop him. Fortunately, a new district superintendent, Rod Page, later U.S. Secretary of Education, was more supportive, so that the success of this school and these methods continued under a new principal, who said bluntly, the teachers' colleges are to blame for so much school failure. Educational success usually provides no protection from the wrath of those who impose their educational dogmas on the schools and will not tolerate seeing those dogmas ignored. High school math teacher Jamie Escalante, whose success in teaching Mexican-American students was celebrated in the movie Stand and Deliver, was eventually hounded out of Garfield High School in Los Angeles. Yet while he was there, about one-fourth of all Mexican-American students in the entire country, who passed advanced placement calculus, came from Garfield High School. Documented results are not allowed to override the prevailing educational dogmas, which pervade the schools of education, the teachers' unions, and state and federal education bureaucracies, none of whom pays the price for the failure of these dogmas. Neither do their children, who are typically enrolled in private schools. What they would have to pay what they would have to pay a price for would be widespread demonstrations that the methods to which they are committed produce educational results that are grossly inferior to those produced by the methods they oppose. Should such revelations become widely known among parents and voters, this would threaten not only their careers, but also their agendas, which include the use of public schools to promote fashionable beliefs and attitudes, political correctness, rather than to equip students' minds with knowledge and develop their capacity for independent use of logic and evidence. None of this says there is just one best way of teaching all students. That would be repeating the dogmatic approach of the education establishment. What the record of successful minority schools shows, both in history and among contemporary schools, is that educational achievement is not foredoomed by economic or social circumstances beyond the school grounds, as the education establishment constantly strives to prove. Poverty, broken homes, and unruly environments are not to be ignored, downplayed, or apologized for, but neither are the failings of others proof that the education establishment is doing its job right. Perfect students with perfect parents in a perfect society cannot learn things that they are not being taught, and that includes an increasing number of basic things in our public schools. While successful minority schools do not use any single formula or ideology, they do make sure to teach those basic things that get neglected by more typical or more trendy schools, beginning with reading. Portland Elementary School in Portland, Arkansas, has multiple violations of prevailing educational dogmas, and such academic success that it is besieged with requests from parents who want to transfer their students in.
Ironically, white students were once transferring out, back in 1970, in response to racial desegregation. Until recent years, declining educational standards were painfully visible in the fact that half the students in the fourth through sixth grade were scoring two or more years below grade level. Then came a new principal with old-fashioned ideas about education who began to get old-fashioned results. Now, 100% of the students are reading at grade level or higher, and a majority of the students are above the national average on both reading and math tests. One of these old-fashioned ideas is called directed instruction, what used to be called just plain old teaching, as distinguished from the more trendy notion that teachers are to be facilitators on the sidelines, letting students discover and create knowledge themselves. In Portland Elementary, directed instruction has proven to be especially effective with at-risk students. In other words, kids who have nobody to teach them at home improve greatly when there is somebody to teach them at school, instead of using them as guinea pigs for experiments. Not satisfied with violating educational dogma by plain old teaching, Principal Ernest Smith also groups students by ability and gives them tests every 10 lessons or about every 7 or 8 days, all of which is taboo in educational establishment circles. So successful has this approach turned out to be that whites have been transferring back in and now constitute a majority of the students. Another successful minority school, 99% black, with 80% of its students coming from low-income families, is Cascade Elementary School in Atlanta. Although its demographics would be considered to be a formula for automatic failure by those in the education establishment, in fact, these students have scored at the 74th percentile on reading tests and at the 83rd percentile on math tests. Principal Alfonso L. Jesse is so old-fashioned that he will not tolerate misbehavior. Jesse explains to parents at the beginning of the year that if their children misbehave in school, they will be personally escorted to the parents' place of work. Not surprisingly, Cascade has almost no discipline problems. Such a principal might well be accused of stereotyping or racism by civil rights groups, community activists, or white liberals if he were not black. Like other schools for minority children, the Marva Collins Preparatory School in Chicago has its founders' no-nonsense back-to-basics curriculum that is centered on phonics and memorization for the younger students and higher-level reasoning and literary analysis for the older ones. It also features weekly tests in all subjects every Friday. It is not hard to understand why Marva Collins was unpopular with education authorities when she taught in the public schools and had to go set up her own private school in order to teach the way that she wanted to. Chicago public schools were declared to be the worst in the nation back in the 1980s by William J. Bennett, then U.S. Secretary of Education. Despite some improvements, even as late as 1996, half of all the children in the Chicago schools were performing below grade level in four-fifths of the city's schools. Yet even here, there has been an exception, using methods that are an exception to the prevailing educational dogmas. Children in Earhart Elementary School, in Chicago's South Side Ghetto, score at 70th percentile in reading and the 80th percentile in math. 99% of these children, sorry, 99% of these children are black, and more than four-fifths of them qualify for the free lunch or reduced price lunch program. Taking advantage of a 1988 law that allowed individual schools more leeway to escape rigid educational dogmas, a new principal began teaching reading based on phonics and memorization of sight words, devoting an hour and a half each morning exclusively to reading. During this reading period, all physical education, music, art, and library activities were brought to a halt so that the entire support staff could help the children with their reading. The school taught things like grammar and composition, which are considered passé in educational circles, but it achieved success, which is also passé in too many public schools today. The KIPP KIPP Academy in Houston, Texas, its name derived from the Knowledge is Power program, has achieved such, such success on both math and reading tests that it has spawned a spin-off with the same name in the Bronx. The first KIPP school began with a campus that consisted of 12 trailers parked near a baseball field at Houston Baptist University. <laughs> 
Like many other successful schools for low-income minority students, its emphasis is on hard work. If you're off the bus, you're working, said its principal and co-founder, Michael Feinberg. KIPP students spend 67% spend more time in the classroom than the average public school student. Each morning, students receive a worksheet of math, logic, and word problems for them to solve in the three minutes that appear throughout the day. KIPP co-founder Michael Feinberg and David Levin, who later headed the Bronx School of the same name, did not begin with theories, such as teachers' colleges do. Instead, they studied what worked in various schools around the country and made that the basis for their program. Not only is this the opposite of the approach used by education experts, so is the KIPP rejection of any single magic formula for teaching. KIPP teachers are free to teach as they see fit, so long as they get results. These teachers also visit parents in their homes to explain what they are doing and what the parents need to do, and they carry cell phones with toll-free numbers so that they can be reached after school hours. They mean business. Many other successful minority schools, too numerous to mention, are operating in various communities around the country. 21 of them were studied by the Heritage Foundation under its No Excuses program. To be eligible for this program, a school must score at or above the 65th percentile on national achievement tests, and 75% of their students must qualify for the subsidized or free lunch program. Most schools where such a high percentage of students come from homes with low enough incomes to qualify for this lunch program score below the 35th percentile. Yet the 21 schools that met the No Excuses program criteria and whose results were published were by no means the only such schools, just the ones that happened to be found in the survey that was conducted. What are the secrets of such successful schools? The biggest secret is that there are no secrets, unless work is a secret. Work seems to be the only four-letter word that cannot be used in public today. Aside from work and discipline, the various successful schools for minority students, for, for minority children, have had little in common with one another, and even less in common with the fashionable educational theories of our times. Some of these schools have been public, some private. Some have been secular, and some have been religious. Dunbar High School had an all-black teaching staff, but St. Augustine in New Orleans began with an all-white teaching staff. Some of these schools were housed in old, rundown buildings, and others in new, modern facilities. Some of their principals were finely attuned to the social and political nuances, while others were blunt people who could not have cared less about such things and would have failed public relations one. Myths and Tragedies Some of the myths surrounding the education of black students have already been noted in passing. That only middle-class youngsters can do well on standardized tests, that racially separate schools are inherently inferior, and that standardized tests are too culturally biased to predict the academic or later success of black students. There are many other myths, and they all contribute to the tragedies that afflict the education of most black students. More than isolated false beliefs are involved, however. Most of these beliefs reflect an overall vision and an agenda that need to be scrutinized. The racial myths. Perhaps the most widespread and most consequential of these myths promulgated by the Supreme Court of the United States is that racially separate schools cannot achieve quality education. In addition to all the black schools that have belied that assumption, there have been successful all Chinese schools in the United States, all Tamil schools in Sri Lanka, and all Armenian schools in the Ottoman Empire, among others. Sometimes the unspoken assumption is that a racial mix of students is helpful or even necessary because students from one group need to acquire better educational habits and attitudes from another group. That attitude has been found among those Malay, Malay parents in Singapore who want who want their children to emulate the more serious and hard-working attitudes of the Chinese students there. But that same assumption cannot be openly avowed about black students in the United States, in the skittish atmosphere surrounding racial issues. Yet the long, bitterly divisive, and ultimately futile campaign of busing students to schools far from home for the sake of racial balance 
is hard to understand without the underlying assumption that black students need to be with white students in order to learn. Thus, the white man's burden doctrine of 19th century imperialism became, in effect, the white child's burden doctrine of 20th century education. A later variation on this theme has been a diversity rationale, that all students learn more in an environment where there are children from other racial, cultural, or, others, or other social backgrounds. While more politically palatable than the separate is inferior doctrine, this diversity rationale has had no more empirical evidence to support it, unless endlessly repeating the word diversity and rhapsodizing over its presumed virtues is considered to be evidence. If one seriously wished to test this doctrine, it would be hard to explain how a racially homogenous nation like Japan could have its students better educated than those in the United States, especially since Japan is one of the most culturally insular contemporary nations, with nothing like the interest in multiculturalism found in Britain and in Brit British offshoot societies like the United States and Australia. But neither this nor any of innumerable other possible empirical tests has been applied to the diversity doctrine. It has simply become dogma, like so much else in education circles. The opposite dogma, that black children require a separate racially oriented or Afrocentric education, has seized the imagination of many, with no more empirical evidence to support it than its Eurocentric counterpart. This vision has spawned such subsidiary notions as a need for racial role models for inspiration, and a critical mass of black students in order for these students to feel socially comfortable enough to do their best. Hard evidence for any of these beliefs has been neither asked for nor given. Moreover, such evidence as exists points in the opposite direction. One of the few attempts to examine the facts, a study titled Increasing Faculty Diversity, found no empirical evidence to support the belief that same-sex, same-ethnicity role models are any more effective than white male role models at the college level. This is consistent with the experiences of successful black schools examined here, some of these schools having all black, others all white, and still others a racially mixed assortment of teachers. If role models of the same race are so important for successful education, then it is virtually impossible to explain the spectacular rise of second-generation Japanese Americans after World War II. The great majority of the previous generation of Japanese Americans were farmers, and it is doubtful whether most of the second-generation children ever saw a Japanese American teacher or professor, much less Japanese Americans who were successful in the fields in which the Nisei, Nisei generation would rise, such as science and engineering. What of the critical mass theory that has been used to support preferential college admissions for black students? Do black students do better educationally where there are enough other black students to create a socially comfortable subculture in schools or on college campuses? As with so many other educational doctrines, the issue is not even posed in such empirical terms. It is simply stated as an imperative and those who question it are scorned as having uncomprehending minds or unworthy motives. But what do the facts show? Again, there have been remarkably few systematic studies of this or many other educational doctrines, especially those involving racial issues. Certainly the remarkable educational success of Dunbar High School graduates, who went on to Amherst College from the late 19th century to the middle of the 20th century, cannot be attributed to either a critical mass of black students on that campus or to black role models on the faculty because they had neither. Studies from more recent times have shown that the education of black students has been negatively affected by the presence of large numbers of other black students. An empirical study published by the National Bureau of Economic Research found that a higher percentage of black schoolmates has a strong adverse effect on the achievement of blacks and moreover that the effects are highly concentrated in the upper half of the ability distribution. Another study focusing on the effect of ability grouping on the performances of students in general mentioned among its conclusions, schooling in a homogeneous group of students appears to have a positive effect on high ability students' achievements and even stronger effects on the achievements of high ability minority youth. 
In other words, a critical mass of black students seems to drag down the academic performance of high ability black students. Yet another study, this one about black students in the affluent suburbs of Shaker Heights, Ohio, showed a pervasive pattern of not only neglecting schoolwork, but even of disdaining it to the point of resenting those black students who applied themselves or who spoke standard English, denouncing them for acting white. Similar social patterns among black students have been found around the country and are much more consistent with Berkeley professor John McWhorter's thesis that there is an anti-intellectual black subculture, which keeps many black students from doing their best. No wonder that a critical mass of black students has the opposite effect on education from what its advocates claim. History. There is a particularly painful irony in the notion that blacks who are seeking to become educated are acting white. During Frederick Law Olmsted's celebrated journey through the antebellum South, he was appalled to learn that a free black man had been publicly whipped in Washington, D.C., for conducting a clandestine school for black children. Not only was it illegal to teach slaves to read and write, it was illegal in many places for free blacks to go to school. Yet clandestine schools for black children existed all over the South, some of which were ignored by the local authorities, though not by all, as this courageous black man discovered in Washington. What a mockery of him and of other courageous black pioneers to say that seeking an education is acting white. Despite bans on education for blacks in the antebellum South, and by no means universal access of blacks to public schools in the North, the census of 1850 showed that most of the approximately half million free blacks could read and write. After emancipation, the achievement of literacy by a majority of black Americans within two generations has been called an accomplishment seldom witnessed in human history by a noted economic historian. Literacy may be something that we take for granted today, but most of the people in Albania were still illiterate in the 1920s, and most of the people in India were still illiterate half a century after that. But how and why literacy was achieved among black Americans as rapidly as it was is a matter of little or no interest to those who treat the history of blacks as the history of white people's treatment of blacks. Thus, the history of the education of blacks in the United States is presented largely as a history of segregated schools starved for funds and of biases against black students by white teachers or by white students in racially integrated settings or other such things which, tra which transform the history of black people into a history of white people in their treatment of blacks. History is too often the handmaiden of contemporary visions or agendas. Accomplishments among blacks are often either magnified or downplayed or glided over entirely according to whether these accomplishments do or do not advance the agenda of portraying victimhood or struggles against victimhood. In this, con in this context, it is explicable, though hardly justified, that the history of successful black schools has attracted virtually no interest from either historians or educators. That history does not advance any contemporary political agenda, though it might help advance the education of a whole generation of black students. Things that do advance contemporary agendas include demands for money to promote the teaching of black English, or Ebonics. Here there is much appeal to history, though largely a fictitious history. The peculiarities of ghetto speech, often imitated even among contemporary black middle-class youth, are said to derive from African speech patterns, when in fact, most of those very same words and phrases were part of the speech patterns in those parts of Britain from which white Southerners came centuries ago. False history is not unique to black Americans. As Daniel Patrick Moy Moynihan said of his fellow Irish Americans, the cruel part of this history is that by 1916, Irish nationalism in America had little to do with Ireland. It was a hodgepodge of fine feeling and bad history with which the immigrants filled a cultural void. Much of what calls itself Afrocentric education is similarly remote from Africa and is similarly filling a cultural void. But now there is huge political support for such things, 
and that has brought forth large amounts of money to subsidize these escapisms. Moreover, these are now regarded as sacrosanct parts of black culture, which insulates them from inquiries into either their authenticity or their educational consequences. Cultural Handicaps The consequences of deficiencies in the education of black students are grave and getting worse, in the sense that an increasingly demanding technology and an increasingly complex world economy have few places for those without skills of the mind. Black students, by and large, lag appallingly behind whites, and still more so behind Asian Americans, in those skills. In 2001, for example, there were more than 16,000 Asian American students who scored above 700 on the mathematics SAT, while fewer than 700 black students scored that high, even though blacks outnumbered Asian Americans several times over. This cannot be explained away by poverty, racism, or innate inferiority. Even Arthur Jensen, the leading proponent of the theory of genetic racial differences in IQ, has said that among the disadvantaged, there are high school students who have failed to learn basic skills that they could easily have learned many years earlier, if taught in different ways. Far from justifying the school's failures to educate black children or regarding these children as uneducable, Professor Jensen concluded, one of the great and relatively untapped reservoirs of mental ability in the disadvantaged, it appears from our research, is the basic ability to learn. We can do more to marshal this strength for educational purposes. In short, even the leading proponent of the belief in innate differences in intelligence does not believe that this could explain the educational deficiencies actually found among disadvantaged youngsters who could easily have mastered the academic skills in which they are lacking. As for income, Asian American students from low-income families score higher on the SAT than black students from upper-income families. But Asian Americans are not self-handicapped by the counterproductive attitudes toward education found even in middle-class black communities. As for the racism of whites as an explanation of black educational deficiencies, there are enough black-run schools, colleges, and universities where there would be dramatically better results than in white-run institutions if racism were the explanation, but no such dramatic differences are visible. The segregated schools in which most blacks were educated for most of their history have provided a tempting explanation of racial differences in test scores and other indices of academic achievement, especially since the separate but equal rationale for segregation was a mockery in practice. Yet the fact that a neat combination of moral and causal arguments can be made does not mean that those arguments should escape empirical scrutiny. Not only have segregated schools not proven to be inferior in many cases, even ethnic groups who sat side by side in the same schools have had as large IQ differences as those between blacks and whites attending segregated schools in the Jim Crow South. Back in the 1950s, Japanese American and Mexican American youngsters in the same school system, and whose parents at that time and place had very similar occupational status, had an average IQ difference of 20 points, slightly more than the black-white IQ differences nationwide, and the same as black-white IQ differences in the Jim Crow South. There was an even larger disparity, an average of 26 IQ points difference, between Jewish and Puerto Rican students attending the same school from the early 1930s to the mid-1950s. Even earlier in the 20th century, German-American children graduated from high school at a rate many times that of Irish-American children. Vast differences in educational performances between groups have been common, not only in America, but in other countries as well, whether they attended the same or different schools. One of the most obvious reasons for the deficient educational performances of blacks is also one of the most overlooked or suppressed. By and large, black students do not work as hard as white students, much less Asian students. The Shaker Heights study is just one that has found this to be so, though many have been reluctant to even investigate this factor that uh, that will be very unsurprising to anyone who has taught black students, white students, and Asian students.
The remarkable exceptions in schools where substandard work has not been tolerated only reinforce this point. If the fundamental problem were income, segregation, or even innate inferiority, there would be no such dramatic contrasts among black schools. Although each of these explanations has been common at various times and places, none of them stands up to empirical scrutiny. If successful education of blacks were just a matter of isolated individuals, of cream rising to the top, then it would be hard to explain such concentrations of educational success at such schools as Dunbar and its counterparts today. Such success has been disproportionately concentrated not only in particular schools, but also in particular families. Out of 4.3 million black families in the United States in 1966, a mere 5.2 thousand produced all the black physicians, dentists, lawyers, and academic doctorates in the country. As rare as people at this level were among blacks, the average black family that included someone in one of these categories averaged 2.2 such individuals. While family concentrations alone might suggest heredity, similar institutional concentrations suggest that it is the culture which promotes or impedes e educational achievement. In a sense, it is misleading to single out blacks for not sharing cultural values that are in fact by no means universal among other groups in the United States or in other countries around the world. Certainly the dedicated work of Chinese Americans or Japanese American students is not the norm among most ethnic groups or in most countries. In white lower class communities in Britain, the same counterproductive attitudes toward education found among blacks in the United States are just as prevalent and just as self-defeating. Higher education. One sign of the sharp social contrasts within the black population, past and present, is that there were blacks going to college in the United States even during the era of slavery, and some of the more affluent free blacks sent their children abroad to be educated. Meanwhile, the vast majority of blacks, held in bondage, could neither read nor write. As with other groups, historic differences had enduring consequences. Well into the 20th century, much of the black leadership and blacks predominant in the professions were descendants of the antebellum free persons of color. An exception was Booker T. Washington, who was born in, in bondage during the last years of slavery, and who, in adulthood, was preoccupied with the education of others like himself from the black masses, rather than the education of the offspring of the more cultured black elite, such as W.E.B. Du Bois. It would be hard to understand these two men's real differences, as distinguished from the caricatures about them produced in later generations, without understanding the very different constituencies they served. Colleges specifically for blacks were established after the Civil War, but most were essentially white institutions for black students, given the scarcity of blacks with the educational qualifications to become professors. Indeed, the scarcity of black students qualified to be in college often meant, in the 19th century, that many of these colleges were essentially elementary and secondary schools by another name. For example, of the 251 students attending Atlanta University in academic year 1872-73, to 73, only 12 were taking college courses, while 128 were taking elementary co school courses. Over the first quarter century of its existence, fewer than 5% of Atlanta University's students took college-level courses. Nor was Atlanta University unique. In order to understand this early era of black higher education, it is necessary to understand the extreme scarcity of black students who had received the preparatory education required for real college education. The first public high school for black children in America was established in 1870, the Washington School that later became known as Dunbar High School. 22 years later, the first public high school for blacks in Baltimore was founded. As late as school year 1915 to 16, there were just 64 public high schools for black children in all 18 southern states put together, with more than half of these high schools being in just four states, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Texas. A survey of 16 southern and border states, plus the District of Columbia, 
showed a grand total of fewer than 9,000 black students enrolled in public secondary schools in 1916. A federal government report on black students noted at the time, while only a fourth of the secondary pupils on the border states are educated at private expense, almost two-thirds of those in the other southern states are in private institutions. The states of the Deep South were the most reluctant to build public high schools for black children. During the 1920s, behind-the-scenes pressure was necessary to get a public high school for blacks built in Atlanta. And as late as the 1930s, only 7% of black youngsters of high school age were attending high schools in Mississippi. Writing in 1944, Gunnar Myrdal noted, High schools for Negroes in the South have existed in significant numbers for only about 20 years and are still inadequate. The situation would have been even more bleak than it was, except for the existence of private schools where black young people could get elementary or secondary education. All schools for blacks in the antebellum South were, of course, private, as well as clandestine. In the first decades after the Civil War, the American Missionary Association established thousands of schools for blacks in the South. Most of the teachers in these schools were young, unmarried women from New England bringing with them not only academic education, but also a whole culture very different from that of Southern society. Many black children thus acquired advantages that they would take with them into the adult world in later life. A noted historian observed it was no accident that so many black leaders of the 20th century civil rights movements came from missionary schools. During the half century following the Civil War, an estimated $57 million was contributed from the North to educate black students in the South, and blacks themselves contributed an additional $24 million. But the Southern states dragged their feet on creating schools, and especially high schools, for black children. This was an era not just of slow progress, but of actual retrogression in some respects. As a scholarly study of this period noted, the disparity between black and white public schools in per capita expenditures was greater in 1910 than in 1900 in every southern state. It was 1916 before as many black children were attending public high schools as were attending private high schools. A federal agency, the Freedmen's Bureau, also contributed to the education of blacks in the years following the Civil War, spending about $3.5 million in the years from 1865 to 1870. Its most enduring legacy was the creation of Howard University in Washington, which became the most prominent of the institutions of higher education for black students. During the decades after the Civil War, it was much easier to create institutions for black students and call them colleges than to supply them with students actually prepared to do college work. Moreover, in this post-bellum era, it was hard to find blacks with the qualifications to become professors, deans, and college presidents. There was a reason why many of what were called colleges and universities for black students were doing largely pre-college work, and why those who ran these institutions and taught the courses were usually white. The Du Bois-Washington Controversy The contemporary habit of reducing serious issues and historic figures to the dimensions of cartoon characters has led to widespread depiction of the rivalry between W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington as a clash between a black militant and an Uncle Tom. Despite very real differences between the two men, Du Bois himself refused to make any such characterization of Washington. Du Bois was among the many people around the country, black and white, north and south, who sent congratulations to Booker T. Washington on his historic 1895 speech at the Atlanta Exposition that set forth Washington's philosophy and marked his emergence as a black educator and leader. More than half a century later, even as a self-exiled communist living in Ghana, Du Bois corrected a student who spoke disparagingly of Booker T. Washington. Du Bois and Washington had overlapping goals in education and in society, but, dim but different emphases. Both recognized the very low standards on education, skills, behavior, and hygiene among most blacks at the end of the 19th century, just one generation removed from the world of the slave plantation. During this era, Du Bois not only criticized the extravagant spending habits he found among blacks in his study, The Philadelphia Negro, he spoke more generally of the great lack which faces our race in the modern world, lack of energy, 
which he attributed to indolence, which had now become a kind of social heredity. Even if whites were to lose their racial prejudices overnight, it would make little difference in the economic position of most blacks, according to Du Bois. Although some few would be promoted, some few would get new places as a result of an end to discrimination. Nevertheless, the mass would remain as they are until the younger generation began to try harder as the race lost the omnipresent excuse for failure, prejudice. Du Bois saw many of the blacks as sunk into listless indifference or shiftlessness or reckless bravado. In short, Du Bois, like Washington, saw an enormous need for self-improvement among blacks at this juncture in history. The big difference was that Washington made self-improvement the principal and overriding goal of the kind of education he established at the Tuskegee Institute, which he founded. Students at Tuskegee were taught job skills, including the skills that enabled them to build many of the buildings at the Institute itself. They were taught deportment, hygiene, and other mundane but important things needed to take control of their own lives and advance in the world. Contrary to legend, Washington never renounced equal rights. It is important and right that all privileges of the law be ours, but it is vastly more important that we be prepared for the exercises of these privileges, he said in his historic Atlanta exposition speech. By linking rights and responsibilities, Washington was able to address both the blacks and the whites in the audience on common ground. And by linking the fates of the two races, he was able to enlist the support of some whites by arguing that blacks would either help lift up the South or help to drag it down. W.E.B. Du Bois likewise said to Southern whites, if you do not lift them up, they will pull you down. Although the two men said many things that were very similar at that time, their differing emphases were clear as well beginning with education. Du Bois emphasized academic education for those whom he called the talented tenth of the race, largely people like Du Bois himself, educated and cultured descendants of the antebellum free persons of color, for whom vocational education would have been a step backward. The very phrase talented tenth implicitly acknowledged that this was not what was most needed by most blacks at that time. Although Du Bois acknowledged the necessity and achievements of vocational education, accomplishments of which it has a right to be proud, he was promoting a very different kind of education for a very different class of people. Moreover, this education and this class of people were intended to spearhead political agitation for civil rights, as exemplified in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which Du Bois helped found. Just as Du Bois acknowledged the need for vocational education for many blacks, so Washington acknowledged the need for academic education for other blacks. He served on the board of trustees for Howard University and Fisk University, whose educational missions were very different from that of Tuskegee Institute. And he used his influence to get financial support for Howard and other black academic institutions, such as Talladega College and Atlanta University. He declared, I would say to the black boy what I would say to the white boy, get all the mental development that your time and pocketbook will allow of. Though he saw most blacks of his time as needing to acquire practical work skills first. Still, he said, I would not have the standard of mental development lowered one whit, for with the Negro, as with all races, mental strength is the basis of all progress. Kelly Miller saw the controversy over differences in educational philosophy to be the work of one-eyed enthusiasts, rather than of men like Du Bois and Washington, who saw the need for both. Booker T. Washington saw his own primary task as the promotion of progress among the many and not the special culture of the few. He saw his work as an educator in his times as preparatory, as laying a foundation for the masses, but not to confine the whole race to the work for which, for which Tuskegee Institute would immediately prepare its students. After speaking proudly of a Tuskegee graduate whose knowledge of chemistry had increased the acreage yield of sweet potatoes several fold, he said, My theory of education for the Negro would not, for example, confine him for all time to farm work, to the production of the best and most sweet potatoes but that if he succeeded in this line of industry, 
he could lay the foundations upon which his children and grandchildren could grow to higher and more important things in life. Even in the present, he said, we need professional men and women. And he looked forward to a time when there would be more successful black lawyers, congressmen, and music teachers. As regards civil rights, although Booker T. Washington wrote in 1899, I do not favor the Negroes giving up anything which is fundamental and which has been guaranteed to him by the Constitution of the United States. His general public posture was that he was too busy with the self-improvement of blacks to become involved in political controversies. Yet, when his papers were examined after his death, it became clear that he had privately goaded other blacks to crusade for civil rights and had even secretly financed legal challenges to the Jim Crow laws in the South. Washington was fully aware that to have done these things publicly would have jeopardized the white financial support on which Tuskegee Institute depended. Nor was this simply a matter of protecting his own interests. He understood the repercussions for others if he made explosive statements in the volatile racial atmosphere of the times. I could stir up a race war in Alabama in six weeks if I chose, he said, but to do so would wipe out the achievements of decades of labor. Yet he also understood that open challenges to racial discrimination had to be made. As he wrote to Oswald Garrison Villard, one of the founders of the NA NAACP, There is work to be done which no one placed in my position can do. Although Du Bois could not have known of all, these, all the things that Washington was doing secretly, he had an insight into the man himself and knew where his loyalties were. Du Bois said of Washington, He had no faith in white people, not the slightest. Booker T. Washington practiced what a later generation of black militants would only preach to advance the cause of blacks by all means necessary. A leading black educator of his time, Dean Kelly Miller of Howard University, said of Washington that the advancement of the black race is the chief burden of his soul. Despite differences between Du Bois and Washington and rivalries between their respective followers, this did not prevent civility between the two men themselves. In Booker T. Washington's autobiography, Up From Slavery, he wrote of a meeting arranged by some good ladies in Boston in 1899, where, in addition to an address by myself, Mr. Paul Lawrence Dunbar read from his poems, and Mr. W.E.B. Du Bois read an original sketch. In 1903, Du Bois wrote a critical essay about Washington that has since been widely quoted. What has not been so widely known is that Du Bois' aunt chided him for that essay, explaining how his role and constraints were very different from those of Booker T. Washington, and expressing her hope that he would never write about the Tuskegee educator that way again. Decades later, recalling this conversation, Du Bois added, and I never did. Black Colleges Although most black colleges began as institutions run by white administrators and staffed by white professors, pressures to change that began in the 19th century. There were at that point relatively few blacks with the education needed to take on these roles, but there were even fewer opportunities for such people to find employment elsewhere. Moreover, there was a concern for the effect on the black students of being educated by whites. As one of the more militant black leaders said in 1885, the intellects of our young people are being educated at the expense of their manhood, because in their classrooms they see only white professors, thereby reinforcing the superiority-inferiority stereotypes. Others, however, cautioned that our youth have the right to the best possible training and we should not allow a mistaken race pride to cause us to impose upon them inferior teachers. Significantly, the parents of these students usually preferred the skills of white teachers to the symbolism of black representation. The pool of qualified black scholars was small. Prior to the First World War, only 14 black Americans had ever received a PhD from a recognized American or European university. Nevertheless, with the passing years, the political pressures eventually won out and colleges for black students began to be staffed increasingly by black professors and run by black administrators, whether or not these professors and administrators had sufficient training or ability. In 1926, half a century after its founding, Howard University had its first black president. A leading black scholar of a later era, 
E. Franklin Frazier, wrote of this transition period as an educational setback, and Dean Kelly Miller, who lived through that era at Howard University, called it a misfortune barely short of a calamity. This was not just a misfortune for that era. Putting underqualified people in charge of black colleges and universities meant that the whole development of these institutions would be shaped or warped by department chairmen, deans, and college president, presidents, whose priorities, including holding on to their jobs, made better qualified blacks who would emerge over time be seen as rivals to be repressed rather than assets to be treasured, and the latter's more intellectual orientation as nothing to be encouraged. The first black president of Howard University, Mordecai W. Johnson, has been cited as a major obstacle to the research of internationally renowned black scientist Ernest Just, whose research grants from prestigious outside institutions were interfered with by Johnson. As late as 1971, decades after the transition to black academic leadership, a study of black colleges concluded, the administration is usually not interested in scholarly performance, though this kind of activity is tolerated, and the spoon-feeding method of teaching certainly does not call for it. The result was that, with a relative handful of exceptions among black institutions, the writing pens of members of these institutions have been virtually silent. The years in office of administrators at black colleges and universities tended to be some multiple of that of the of that of administrators in white institutions, given the black administrators' lack of viable alternatives in a larger society. Mordecai Johnson, for example, remained president of Howard University for 34 years. The net result was that the influence of the initial generation of underqualified people lasted longer and shaped the enduring values and priorities that prevailed on black campuses. These values and priorities, in turn, shaped the kinds of people who would be groomed and selected to become their successors, perpetuating low academic standards, frivolous social activities among students, and indifference, incompetence, and corruption among the administration and faculty. The transition from white to black leadership in black colleges was much more than a racial change. It was a major cultural change from a missionary generation of academic leaders bent on supplanting the existing black redneck culture with a transplanted culture representing very different values to new leaders more accommodating to the black redneck culture in all its aspects, from academic laxity to sexual laxity, showiness, and corruption. In the words of E. Franklin Frazier, the entire orientation and aim of higher education of Negroes was changing. Among these changes was that traditional standards of morals and manners gave way among both students and their teachers. Students became far less interested in academic study than in such things as fraternities, sororities, and parties. Partly this reflected a changing mix of students as colleges, black and white, drew on a broader social range after the Second World War, partly as a result of the availability of financial support from the GI Bill. Writing in the middle of the 20th century, Frazier said, the average Negro who enters the Negro college has had little contact with books and has not developed reading habits. Moreover, when he enters college, he does not find an atmosphere where educational values and scholarship are highly respected. Frazier described the new black college students as listless and less concerned with the history or understanding of the world around them than with their appearance at the next social affair. Moreover, such concerns were supported by the new generation of administrators. The girl with a peasant or working class background may be irritated by her mother's inability to buy an expensive party dress, but what can be expected when the dean of women has instructed her to tell her mother that she must have the dress at any sacrifice? As for the faculty, Professor Frazier described them this way in the middle of the 20th century. Unlike the, missionary, unlike the missionary teachers, the present teachers have little interest in making men, but are concerned primarily with teaching as a source of income, which will enable them to maintain middle-class standards and participate in Negro society. It appears that the majority of them have no knowledge of books, nor any real love of literature. 
Today, many of the teachers of English and literature never read a book as a source of pleasure or recreation. In short, the black colleges retrogressed toward the black redneck culture. The stultifying and anti-intellectual atmosphere on many black college campuses has been described with painful frankness in Professor Frazier's 1958 book, Black Bourgeoisie, by black novelist Ralph Ellison in The Invisible Man, and by white scholars Christopher Jenks and David Reisman in a comprehensive 1967 article in the Harvard Educational Review, which may well have been the last honest study of black colleges given the rising racial militancy and the automatic labeling of white critics as racist. There have been no black college equivalents of Dunbar High School or other high-achieving black elementary and secondary schools. One major historic difference between black colleges and Dunbar High School was the highly qualified, if not overqualified, early leadership of Dunbar and the underqualified first generation of black leadership of the black colleges the latter put in place for purposes of symbolic racial representation. There were enduring consequences to the different calibers of people who shaped these different institutions in their formative stages and set in motion values and priorities which shaped and selected their successors in the generations ahead. In a much later era, beginning in the 1960s, a similar setting up of black studies departments at predominantly white colleges across the country with little or no regard to the wholly inadequate numbers of academically qualified people to staff so many departments established simultaneously, likewise put in place a first generation of black academics who would lead such departments in non-academic or even anti-intellectual directions. Even though there was no inherent reason why the scholarly study of the history, economics, politics, or sociology of black Americans could not be a serious enterprise, in practice, black studies programs, by and large, became noted for shoddy standards for both students and faculty. It is doubtful whether so many academic departments could be set up simultaneously in any academic field without exhausting the pool of qualified faculty members, but no one attempted such a thing in traditional academic departments. As with many of the black colleges, the inadequacies of the black pioneers in black studies warped the future, even after those pioneers passed from the scene and better qualified people became available. By the same token, the kinds of highly qualified people who shaped the future Dunbar High School in its formative years left an enduring legacy of high standards and performances. White Colleges Although black students were admitted to some white colleges, notably Oberlin, Bod Bodoin, Hillsdale, and Western Reserve, even before the Civil War, most postbellum black students pursued their higher education at the black colleges until the 1960s. In the decades that followed, up to the present, the majority of black students have attended predominantly white colleges. Given the scarcity of black students with the educational background and academic achievements common among other students at the predominantly white colleges, these institutions' desires to secure a demographically representative student body made lower standards of admission for blacks virtually inevitable. This problem was not confined to colleges with very high academic standards. When top-tier colleges and universities accepted black students who met the normal qualifications for second-tier institutions, similar pressures led second-tier institutions to accept black students who would normally qualify for third-tier colleges and universities, and so on down the line. With black students systematically mismatched with academic institutions across the spectrum, it can hardly be surprising that most black students nationwide fail to graduate. Such negative educational results repeated a pattern of bad educational results from making educational decisions on non-educational grounds that began with the creation of black colleges that were colleges in name only in the 19th century for the sake of denominational rivalry and later putting underqualified people in charge of these black colleges for the sake of racial representation. Very similar corrupting and anti-intellectual consequences have followed latter-day educational policies 
based on demographic representation. Moreover, these consequences have endured, even through turnovers of students and faculty over the years. The admission of black students with qualifications markedly lower than those of the other students at the same institutions was soon followed by hiring black faculty members with qualifications likewise lower than those of their white and Asian faculty colleagues. This was done for the same reason, namely that there were simply not enough blacks with the usual academic qualifications to achieve demographic representation any other way. Not only are there far fewer black students than Asian American students who reach the usual test scores th than who reach the usual test score levels found at selective colleges, this shortfall is even more drastic at the postgraduate level, where future faculty members are produced. In some years, the absolute number of blacks receiving PhDs in mathematics did not reach double digits. Summary and implications. Education has played a crucial role in the advancement of blacks over the generations and in the lag of the lags of blacks behind others in the American economy. In order to understand both the lags and the advancement, it is necessary to understand the extremely low level uh, from which the education of most black Americans began and the very long time before the great majority of blacks had the kind of education that would qualify them for many of the occupations in which education was essential. Racial discrimination barriers kept educated blacks out of some of these occupations, but until perhaps the middle of the 20th century, there were relatively few blacks to be kept out by such barriers. Looked at differently, the dramatic increases in the numbers of blacks in many professional occupations in the last half of the 20th century cannot be attributed solely or even primarily to the removal of these barriers by civil rights legislation. The rise of blacks into professional and other high-level occupations was greater in the years preceding passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 than in the years following passage of that act. What had happened was a dramatic increase in the numbers of blacks with college and postgraduate education. Prior to the First World War, Fewer than 5,000 college degrees have been granted to black students in the entire history of the United States, but by 1935 that had increased fivefold, and by 1947 the black colleges alone granted in one year more degrees than blacks had ever received in all the years prior to the First World War. Increases in the numbers of doctorates received by blacks were also dramatic. Similarly, Despite a widespread tendency to see the rise of blacks out of poverty as due to the civil rights movement and government social programs of the 1960s, in reality, the rise of blacks out of poverty was greater in the two decades preceding 1960 than in the decades that followed. Education was a major factor in this as well. As of 1940, non-white males averaged just 5.4 years of schooling compared to 8.7 for white males. Over the next two decades, the absolute amount of education increased for both, and the gap between them narrowed. In 1940, the difference in schooling between black and white young adult males, aged 25 to 29, was four years, but by 1960, that had shrunk to less than two years. Because this was an era of massive black migration out of the South, this quantitative narrowing of the gap in schooling may well have been accompanied by a qualitative improvement, as many blacks left behind the low-quality schools in the Jim Crow South. How did this translate into economic change? As of 1940, more than four-fifths of black families, 87% in fact, lived below the official poverty level. By 1960, this had fallen to 47%. In other words, the poverty rate among blacks had been nearly cut in half, before either the Civil Rights Revolution or the Great Society social programs began in the 1960s. The continuation of this trend can hardly be automatically credited to these political developments, though such claims are often made, usually ignoring the pre-existing trends whose momentum could hardly have been expected to stop in the absence of such legislation. By 1970, the poverty rate among blacks had fallen to 30%, a welcome development, but by no means unprecedented. 
A decade after that, with the rise of affirmative action in the intervening years, the poverty rate among black families had fallen to 29%. Even if one attributes all of this 1% decline to government policy, it does not compare to the dramatic declines in poverty among blacks when the only major change was the rise in their education. Whatever the merits of various movements and programs on other grounds, the claim that they were the primary factor in the economic advancement of blacks cannot be squared with the facts. Yet a whole generation of black leaders, intellectuals, and activists have become committed to such movements and programs and their accompanying rhetoric. However, Frederick Douglass warned, as far back as the 1870s, that blacks should cultivate their brains more and their lungs less. While no one can deny the existence of racial discrimination in employment, housing, and other areas, the assumption that the magnitude of employment discrimination can be measured by relative numbers of blacks in particular occupations ignores the huge quantitative and qualitative differences in education between blacks and whites which existed in past generations, often as a result of government discrimination in the provision of educational resources. Without an understanding of the reasons for both the lags and the progress of blacks in the past, policy prescriptions for future advancement risk misplaced emphases. For more, spe uh, more specifically, it risks underestimating the importance of the quantity and quality of education, which depends upon both students and teachers, and much less on the amount of money fed into education bur bureaucracies, or on the fads and panaceas that come and go in the schools and colleges. While the New England culture that was transplanted into various southern enclaves after the Civil War had remarkable successes, later successful black schools a century later usually had no, no New England origins. But, like New England, they represented a culture very unlike the black redneck culture. Ralph Ellison has pointed out that such stellar black singers as Paul Robeson and Marian Anderson received their development from an extensive personal contact with European culture, free from the influences which shape Southern Negro personality in the United States. For those who are interested in schools that produce academic successes, success for minority students, there is no lack of examples, past and present. Tragically, there has been an utter lack of interest in academically successful black schools by most educators. Among the few who have even bothered to take notice, too many have been as dogmatic as Kenneth B. Clark, who said that excellence at Dunbar represented the few, that Dunbar is the only example in our history of a separate black school that was able somehow to be equal, a result of unique circumstances that could scarcely have existed in any other part of the country. Every one of these unsubstantiated claims was demonstrably untrue. One third of all the black high school students in Washington were not the few. There were and are other black schools that met or exceeded national norms, as examples discussed here have shown. And far from being confined to Washington, they have been found from New England to California. Why this ignoring or dismissal of examples of black educational success? Sometimes the reason is ideological. Some, like Professor Clark, have a vested interest in the doctrine that separate is inferior, which underpinned the historic Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court decision, in which his research was cited. To say that mixing and matching racial groups is not a prerequisite for quality education would call into question the decades-long school busing struggle, which might then be seen in retrospect as a costly and divisive wild goose chase and questions might be raised about the current mantra of diversity. Other reasons for ignoring or downplaying successful black schools include the fact that there is no political mileage or financial benefits to be gotten from focusing on such schools, despite how much of an educational goldmine their experience might be for black children. Put bluntly, failure attracts more money than success. Politically, Failure becomes a reason to demand more money, smaller classes, and more trendy courses and programs, ranging from black English to bilingualism and self-esteem. Politicians who want to look compassionate and concerned 
know that voting money for such projects accomplishes that person for that purpose for them and voting against such programs risks charges of mean-spiritedness if not implications of racism ironically many of the bitter end defenders of the current public school system and its educational dogmas are also in favor of preferential admissions of minority students to colleges and universities in other words Having denied minority children an opportunity to develop the kinds of intellectual skills that would make lower admissions standards for them unnecessary, they then send minority students on to institutions where they are less likely to meet course standards designed for better prepared students, and where most minority students do not last long enough to graduate. During their time on campus, such students help present a photogenic picture of diversity on many campuses, but their roles are much like those of movie extras, who simply provide a background for others. Despite many pious expressions of goodwill and hope for improvements in the education of minority students, few are prepared to do what it takes, including taking on entrenched vested interests in the schools of education, the teachers' unions, and state, local, and national education bureau educational bu bureaucracies. Even fewer are prepared to challenge black students to work harder and abandon the counterproductive notion that seeking educational excellence is acting white. Despite the heartening achievements of some black schools, which have repeatedly demonstrated what is possible, even with children from low income backgrounds, the general picture of the education of black students is bleak. Much of what is said and not said about the education of black students reflects the political context rather than the educational facts. Whites walk on eggshells for fear of being called racists, while many blacks are preoccupied with protecting the image of black students rather than protecting their future by telling the blunt truth. It is understandable that some people are concerned about image, about what in private life might be expressed as, what will the neighbors think? But when your children are dying, you don't worry about what the neighbors think.